Right. Oh, but it's... No, not there we go. Drama. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll pray for you, brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, brothers. Lewis, it's good to see you, man. I haven't seen you in a long time. Hey, we got Knott's Berry Farm on the line, too. Hey. Who? <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, I spotted you, man. I said, let me make sure Brett's ready. <laughs> right, right, right. All right, let me get my act uh, together here. Okay. Let me see here. I got to get make sure the screen is recording. All right. Oh, oh, oh. Let's see. Is that how does that work? All right. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. How does that work? Let me see if I can get rid of that. Okay, there we go. Cool, cool, cool. Or do I need a do I need a Bible? Do I have to grab do I, should I grab a Bible real quick? Um, nah, we're, we're just going to go through the alphabet, honestly. So, um, okay. maybe like later on towards the thing, if somebody want to do, uh, let's see. So it's just like, I guess this is all that's coming. Uh, so just, uh, well, we okay, don't, just four of us. I don't see the other guy from St. Louis. Oh, St. Louis, St. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's Jim right here. Um, you see him? I see him. yeah, Jim. The uh, good-looking ball guy, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I see David. Yeah, he's not gonna be able to make it. That's right. He said that. And then yeah, I don't know. We're gonna try to figure out how to work it out with Ken, and then the other brother. I'm trying to remember his name. That's his uh, compadre there. They're in the Philippines, so it's like seven in the morning there for them. I don't know if they're gonna jump on, or we might have to push it hour forward, or talk to them and see. Um, I don't remember if he said he was going to make it or not. And then, um, let's see, Sh uh, Shane. Okay, yeah, Shane said he was going to make it. And I guess, yeah, we got, we got Frank on here, but I think he said something about he doesn't have a mic and a camera. So, but yeah, I guess, I guess, Frank, you can, you can hear. I hope. I'm sure you can. Um, there you go. So. Oh, that's perfect. I just set my phone up. There you nice. go. <laughs> there you go. Okay. All right. Let's see here. So. Um, oh, somebody just found a camera, possibly. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, he said something about yeah, finding a camera. All right. I guess I could have wrote, let's see. My daughter may slip in and listen a little bit. Oh, nice. Okay. All right, let's see. Yeah. Learning Greek doesn't appeal to an 11-year-old right away. <laughs> yeah, but I bet she'd pick it right up. Kids learn quick. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like me at 40. I'm going to kind of have to force things into my head. I know. Me too, man. My memory's getting really bad. Um, okay. So anyway, guys, so um, hopefully yeah, um, Frank can uh, get a camera or at least get a mic. Um, that'd be cool. So yeah, so this is what we're going to do. Uh, I don't know. Does, does anybody, because um, I know months ago i put a post out there probably nobody here but maybe some others that might join in the class next week or after that had made mention of maybe using bill mounts's textbook um i haven't really studied it much i got so many different textbooks and materials i, I just i just figured i'd probably just draw from resources that are available freely on the internet and you know not get into it with as much intensity as maybe like a typical seminary course would um but just more like just practical what's the most common things that people need to know and uh, just start out like that with this first course you know <clears throat> most courses i think start out a lot of them do um 
you first you learn the alphabet not many of them try to like get people to pronounce it too much but with the uh, schools that i've been a part of polis that's their whole thing their their claim is and i and i totally see it that you know for you to really learn a language and really own it um wrap your mind around it where it becomes part of you you have to speak it and it just becomes part of you and the more you do that you know it's it's I don't know. For me, I've kind of done a little bit of both, um, studying, you know, the traditional way, and then, and then trying also to to speak it and listen to a lot of the recordings of um, the class, you know, the classes that I that I took, and then also just other people that went to that school they have that material on the internet where I can just listen to them and as they're going through new vocabulary or talking about things that. Um, just helps me practice the language and stuff. So that's helped me a lot. So eventually we'll mix some of that in as well. Um, but basically, yeah, so what I got here, can you guys see my screen okay? I can see it okay. Yeah. I just um, see the, you see no, you're not, you're not sharing your screen. Oh, I'm not sharing the screen. Okay, let me do that. All right, let's see, share the screen. Uh, okay. All right, am I, am I going to have to minimize that maybe? All right, that's probably better, right? Yeah, we can we can see that, yep. Okay. So, yeah, the Greek alphabet is 24 characters. And, you know, there is an uppercase and a lowercase. Um, the lowercase is used most often. Like when you're – if you pick up an interlinear, um, that's what you're going to see. You know, usually they will start out, I think, if I remember right, Let's see. I don't know when my mind is blanking out, but usually, and in fact, I can just go to a page here. Um, the first letter to start a sentence, which not necessarily that they do that in Greek, but that's that's what they do. Um, let's see, I'm pretty sure it's the way they do. And then they use periods as well. But some of these really old manuscripts, they're all capital letters. Apparently, the reason why they did it, and I see scholars say this, and it just makes sense. I mean, is it true or not? I mean, I don't know. I don't know what their source is for this information, but it's reasonable. And that is, is since there's no spaces, and even that they would use like common words in kind of a um, abbreviated way, um, like for theos, it's four letters. Well, they use the first letter theta and the last letter sigma. And you'll see that scattered throughout the manuscript, and there'll be a certain little type annotation there to where you you know that's what that is. It's, that's Theos, you know, and which is God means God. And they'll be this. They'll do the same thing for Jesus's name. They'll do the same thing for Christ. They'll do the same thing for um, the Holy Spirit, whatever. All those common kind of words. And so you got all these capital letters, and they're all squished together with no spaces. There's no punctuation. There's no accents. So it's challenging. And so when we look at like on uh, Facebook, I'll show you real quick, you guys. Well, actually, I got it right here. You guys have seen it on the Facebook wall, I'm sure. I think most of you have seen this. So this is typical of those older man manuscripts, all capital letters, no spaces. So once you really learn the Greek language, you can really start to, to see differences. Now, one thing as we get into the alphabet, which we're about to get into, You'll notice this that looks like to us in our alphabet a C. You won't see that because during during different eras they didn't really use a sigma, which would be like an S in our language, um, but they used a C for some reason. I'm I'm not really sure. So, um, but this is kind of what it looked like. And then this is what you would see this kind of thing down below here. You guys see John three sixteen here. Yeah, so Hutos yeah. God, Agape San, Hotheos, Ton Cosmon. So this is the sort of thing of what you would see in our interlinear. And in most of this, except for the first letter, um, here they capitalize Theos. Um, kind of like they do in English, you know, capitalize in the first letter. But again, when you look at these old manuscripts, it's not like that, right? So when they jump from here to this, which is the modern approach, they're speculatively saying, oh, you know, if they see a word, they go, oh, we're going to make that capitalize. And when you see the name for Jesus or Theos or or something like that, it's not a big deal. But when you see words like panuma, which is spirit, um, and then you start to see that, oh, the, the Bible does teach that humans have a spirit, not just a soul. 
then it's like, okay, is that the Holy Spirit or is that, you know? So sometimes some of that speculation they do and they bring that into our English Bibles um, is their opinion that is not declared that it's their opinion. It's it's implied as if, wow, this is this is this the Bible. So it can steer people's thinking in, in a certain direction. So I'll just mention that. But um, but anyway, yeah, we'll get into the alphabet today. Um, and then very soon we'll, you know, we'll get into some, you know, basic verbs and understand some basic, uh, um, I guess, you know, some people call them paradigms, but where you're looking at the three elements of verbs. And I'll just mention it now. Um, you know, there's uh, tense, which we have in English. There's mood, which we don't have in English verbs. Um, and then there's voice, which we also don't have in English verbs. Um, so we'll look at those, see the different angles. You can almost think of it as like length, breadth, and width, like three-dimensional <laughs> in, in an analogous sort of way. There's three different elements. What What's that? Tense, mood, and what? And voice. Yeah, tense, voice. mood, and oh. yeah. So they, they all contribute to the meaning of that verb. And um, yeah, so you... Over time, you'll see, I mean, I can make a blanket statement now, but all, over time, you'll see that, um, and I've heard Hebrews the same, that Greek is a very powerful language to secure the intended message um, over time or from point to point or whatever, um, as opposed to English, there's a lot of weaknesses to it that you know, sometimes there can be misunderstanding. I mean, you can still have misunderstandings in Greek, but there's just certain elements about it that are just very well um, distinguish between, you know, when you look at a word all by itself, and let's say you got some manuscripts where there's some fragments, like whether it's a little hole in the plant material, the papyrus, where that, you know, Greek is written on, and you're like, okay, I don't know what that word is right there. Or faded out. Let's say it faded. That's one situation. But I can see these words here, but then this other one, like the whole, um, you know, papyrus or the whole like paper, you can think of it as, in fact, that's where we get our word paper, um, is just like, it just is missing. It's just clipped off or it's like just maybe it dried up and kind of just crumbled or whatever. But I got these words, but I don't know what preceded it. I don't know what was after or whatever. Well, you've got a lot of information embedded in all the words that will distinguish it from like knowing that it, you know, this noun was the subject or this noun was the possessive form, um, which we kind of have that in English with apostrophe S a lot of times, um, you know, or whether it was, you know, the direct object or the indirect object of the sentence or all those kinds of things. So, so you'll see Greek is a really powerful language to, you know, convey and um, protect meaning um, but at a word level, not just that they have to be ordered in a certain way like it is in English. Because uh, in English, I can have the same noun spelled exactly the same. And if it's in front of the verb, then, it's, oh, that's the subject. But if it's after the verb, oh, that's the direct object kind of thing or whatever. Or Greek, Greek is not like that. I mean, you can have the words kind of jumbled and you still will know, oh, no, that's the direct object. That's the subject or whatever. So, but um, anyway, we won't, don't worry about remembering all that. I mean, I just mentioned that we're going to mention a lot of stuff, you know, often to help us learn and stuff. But anyway, Greek uh, alphabet has 24 characters. Um, like I said, we got alpha or they got the uppercase, which you don't have to know this, but they call it unseals. I guess I could write that um, in Greek. And then the lowercase they call uh, minuscule. I think I'm spelling this right. And so the older manuscripts, I don't know, up until, I'm not sure, it was pretty much a tradition, 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth century, whatever, to mostly write. Like when you're looking at old stuff, like 2nd, 3rd, 4th century, that's pretty much our oldest manuscripts, the 2nd century. Um, you're going to be looking at stuff, all capital letters, so it's unseals. Like I said, there's no spaces. It's challenging to read. And then the later traditions started changing to where it became mostly minuscules. And some of it was like geographic, like you might be in this region, let's say Alexandria, Egypt, and you tend to see that maybe later or earlier versus maybe you go over to modern day Turkey, which would be 
uh, Constantinople. I guess that's where uh, Constantine's city got named or whatever. Uh, but maybe you would see it maybe a little, starting a little bit earlier, maybe a century earlier or later or something or whatever. So they're not like all across the globe over there happening at the same time where they shift from one tradition to the other. It's kind of, there's a little bit of a variation or whatever. And not only that, but even some of the manuscripts that um, when I took one class, I went to Rome last year and we were in the um, this amazing library, all sitting in, around a table reading these manuscripts that were dated like, I think 15th century or something like that, um, reading the Gospel of John. Um, it was kind of a cursive type of text. It was kind of challenging to read. Um, then what we're going to look at now, this is just the typical way of looking at Greek letters. Um, but anyway, I'll just throw that out at you. So if we were using Greek letters, can you guys see I'm highlighting that right there with alpha? Yeah. Okay. So that's how you would, if once you get comfortable with these letters, you start to understand, you've got the uh, pronunciation, all that kind of stuff. Um, this is how you pronounce it with Greek letters, but with English, um, you know, this is how we would kind of phonetically spell it. So you can see there's two syllables there and syllables are divided by, you got to have a vowel wherever there's a vowel. Um, we'll look at what the dinks, distinction between vowels and diphthongs here pretty soon. But um, well, where you have those that together with consonants, you don't have to have consonants, but that kind of divides words into different syllables. So um, I put capital letters where there should be emphasis and you'll kind of get a clue, not that it's going to probably be a while before you have to worry about accents too much. But um, but you'll see over here on the far left, in the front end, that you got some accents. And it's like, oh, wow, hey, we got emphasis right here. So this is alpha and then beta. Um, so this is our first letter, alpha, and this is lowercase alpha. And then second one is beta and then lowercase right there. So again, this is what you want to focus on how to learn how to pronounce these and I'll see if I can put this on Google Drive and then I'll send you guys the link on this uh, on this chat here uh, for Let's Learn Greek, when in Greek. And so you guys can go capture it or, or if that doesn't work, I can always email it. You know, I got your email addresses and and then you guys could click the link and go to my Google Drive and download um, the file. And um, or you can go. I'll push the video up on YouTube and you can go to the YouTube as well. Um, but anyway, so. If you guys could, if we could all together go through these, um, or at least try, um, I don't know if is Frank still, um, let's see. Yeah, can you hear? Oh, there we go. Hey, man. How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> Greetings. <laughs> I'll get this thing set up better next time. <laughs> cool, cool. All right. So, yeah, so this is Frank, and then let's see, this is Lewis right here. This is Jim. So, Greetings. Yeah. Some good brothers. Nice to meet you. All right. So yeah, they, so if we can together pronounce these. Um, uh, so again, you're gonna put emphasis on that first syllable, alpha. Can everybody say alpha? Alpha. Awesome. Wow. That's alpha. Like, a, that's like a native. You guys sound like you're from Greece or something. <laughs> So cool. Um, so beta. Beta. Awesome. Beta. Now, you, you, when you say beta, do you, do you draw it? Yeah. Just to emphasize it, say, or, or you just pronounce it? I guess or I should have. You say, say. Yeah, I should have made that capital letter. So, yeah, you would just say alpha. Alpha. Alpha, yeah. Beta. Beta. Some of these are more challenging than others, but some of these in the beginning are pretty simple. Yeah. So um, don't, yeah, don't overthink it or something, but yeah, just alpha. And then the next one would be beta. And um, I think beta. everybody said beta. Okay. Beta. Um, beta. Okay. And then gamma. This, this is gamma. Oh, what happened? Whoa. What? Okay. There we go. Okay, cool. Man, that was strange. Um, so gamma, so yeah, you can see it kind of almost looks like uh, playing hangman or something uh, for the capital. And then this one here almost looks like a Y. It's kind of funny. 
Um, I'll just show you real quick. Um, there's a lot of words in Greek that um, this letter right here, upsilon, um, it looks like it looks like a U. It's kind of pronounced like that. But when it's capital, it looks like a Y. And so we'll see some words in Greek that is like, I'll just give you one, for instance, like soon. Um, like soon is kind of is a preposition. It means like with something. And so whenever it's in capitals, the capital letter looks like a Y. So when they import that into English, you know, to kind of take the word like synagogue, instead of it being pronounced synagogue, like a upsilon, like a U, um, they use the capital. So everybody pronounces it as a Y. So they say synagogue. So I just, you'll see that common. You'll, you'll see that a lot whenever, because you'll see that, yeah, there's a lot of Latin influence in English, but there's also a lot of uh, Greek influence in English too. So um, I think it's common for Catholics to, um, if, well, I don't know how common, but it's definitely more common than Protestants, um, maybe even Orthodox for um, their young people to learn Greek and Latin a lot in school. So when they go take their SATs and stuff, they probably do pretty good. Um, Cause yeah, I really help you. You'd be able to, even if you don't know a word, you can start to figure it out when you got a multiple choice test, what that means and stuff. So, um, so anyway, so we got gamma, you guys say gamma, 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 gamma. There you go. And Delta. Epsilon. Epsilon. Okay. Well, I guess, I guess technically Epsilon, I guess is the way you would say, it. I tend to say Epsilon because that's how everybody seems to pronounce a lot of times, but um, you would actually it'd be kind of a, like a, like a long O, but there is a distinction between with that sound between this letter here, O versus a longer O, which would be Omega. We're going to see these like Omicron, Omicron, uh, so this is the little o. So micron means like little. That's where we get our word like micro or something like that. Um, so omicron, so small o. And this is omega. So mega means big or great. Um, uh, you know, like in the Old Testament, it talks about in the Greek Old Testament, where it talks about the, the, the great day of the Lord, you know, uh, kind of thing. It's, it's that word, actually. Um, so anyway, Omega, so this would be the big O and this is the little O. And so this is supposed to be, you're supposed to hold it a little bit longer than this one be a little bit shorter, but other, but other than that, they're, they basically are pronounced the same. Um, so that's kind of what you're getting out of this. When you say, um, Epsilon, um, if it was a Omega, then it would be kind of a longer, but, but it's really just an Omicron. So, um, Oh, I guess, yeah, some of these, I totally didn't, wait, what happened here? Did I never finish that? Okay, I guess I didn't. Hmm, okay. I just wrote it in our gringo characters, but I didn't write it in the rest of these with the Greek. I'll, I'll do that before I upload it. Um, but anyway, we're all still learning anyway, so. So anyway, um, epsilon. So everybody say epsilon. 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 Okay, and then uh, um, z is uh, zeta here. Um, this letter is zeta. Um, is kind of tricky. It's almost kind of like Europeans will a lot of times um, when they do their z's, they'll say um, z or whatever. It's kind of like there's like a z and a d back to back, like zde, zdeta. It's kind of way. Is the way you pronounce this. So some people pronounce it Zeta, but it's from the way I learned it, it's you know it's Zeta. So so if we could say it like that, that might take some practice. Zeta. 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 Yeah. So yeah, Zeta. Frank, can you say that? Zeta. Zeta. Okay. Uh, did you pronounce it? Yeah, put emphasis on the wherever the capital is. Yeah, put emphasis on that. It's data. Okay. Yeah. Data. It's data. Okay. And then uh, eta. So that's pretty simple. Eta. So eta. Eta. Yeah. So you guys will notice the. Um, you'll get at least for me. Um, 
when I was learning, I was always using, which we probably will too, always using lowercase. So I'm used to seeing this almost looks like an italics N or something, you know, um, although it's not pronounced like that at all, as we can see. Um, but then when you look at the capital, it's like, whoa, they don't even, don't even look the same. Because when you look at theta, yeah, you could like, okay, I can resemble, I see the resemblance. Here's the son, looks like his dad. Yeah, no problem. But, um, <laughs> but this one here, it doesn't look like that one to me. I mean, maybe if you had a bar above it, yeah, then you could say, oh, he has a little, like a little H or something. But so anyway, but eta, that's how it's, that's how it's pronounced. Um, it's actually one of the vowels, even though it looks like an H or something. Um, it's one of the long vowels. We'll see a distinction between short vowels and long vowels. So anyway, so here's theta. 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 Okay. Theta. 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 There you go. And then here's another vowel. Um, yota, so it's like iota, iota, iota. It almost is almost comes across when I say it fast. Iota, it sounds like there's a y in there. So that's why I just kind of well, it's kind of like this. Iota, so it's i iota, 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 yeah. iota, iota. Okay, okay, Lewis, did you say that, man? Yeah, iota. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Um, and then kappa. So kappa, so kappa. that's where we want to put the emphasis, kappa. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty easy, right? It looks like our K. And then um, it's like these in our alphabet, because some of these, the order, the way they go is kind of like our alphabet. So we go A, B, and then, okay, that's gamma is kind of like our G, so that's out of order. That's not like our C. But D, like delta, E for epsilon, and then this is a little bit out of order. But then you skip J, but you got... You know, almost like our I, K, L, Lambda. So, and then M, N, very similar. And then we'll see O, P. So there's a lot of them that are kind of similar, at least kind of the way they sound anyway. Maybe this looks different with Lambda, but. So anyway, so that's why we would say it Lambda. Lambda. Yeah. Lambda. Lambda. And then M, this kind of looks like an M. Uh, that's Mu. Mu. Some may even say um, mu, but, you know, kind of go with mu. So mu, and then th this one here is nu. I don't know if you guys want to say, let's see. I don't know if everybody said mu. Mu, mu and then nu. Mu, Okay. I, th I thought I had this and then put that in. I didn't save it or something. Hmm. Okay. All right. Let's see. And now this one's tricky. This is one of the tricky ones. Um, it's almost like this one. Zday. You got to kind of get that together. Zdata. Um, this one here is like okay. this letter right here. It's kind of like a K and an S together. So it's C. C. C, yeah, yeah, it's tricky. C, and then um, this one is O, so it's Omicron. So it looks like our O anyway. Omicron. Yeah. Omicron. Yeah, kind of like this was epsilon. This is Omicron. So it's kind of similar ending there. Cron and lon. Epsilon, Omicron. Okay. And then this one here, I think in math class algebra, we're learning as pi. Um, the Erasmian approach pronounced it as P. So kind of like our letter. And then um, this looks like a P, but it's actually like our R. So this is rho. Rho. Yeah, rho. Rho. And then sigma, this is kind of like our S. I guess I should... should uh, Okay, so you'll see, we'll see this later on that whenever this letter, at least for lowercase, not uppercase, it looks the same all the time. It looks like the summation symbol you use in like algebra class or something. But um, uh, whenever you're in the middle or at the front of, of a word, you would always use this one. The only time you use this one is when it's the very last letter of a word. And then it changes from here and makes it like that. 
you can look at some ancient literature. Let's say you're looking at Homer's Iliad or some, and you may see this on the end. They just, they didn't do this. And I don't know if it was a tradition that came later. I, I don't know why that is, but sometimes I'll see that where this is even in the last letter sometimes, even in like, I've got various lexicons that I use. And sometimes I'll see words in there like that instead of with this at the end. So, so for instance, I'll just show you. So like if I wrote Sigma in Greek, I read it like that. Um, maybe if I was saying sig sigmas, I, I wouldn't write it like that. I would write it like this. So whenever there's a S or a sigma at the end, it's like that. Um, and then tau, this is kind of like when we say the word ouch, like ow. So tau. So that's that's this letter here is kind of like our T. So everybody say tau, tau, yeah, not not, not touch, <laughs> but tau. I, I I know nobody said that, but I just thought I'm trying to be funny. Uh, yeah, there you go. Um, actually, I could probably. Do I kill my camera? Mm -hmm. That's all right. Um, so here, the um, this one here is kind of like the lowercase, kind of like our letter U. So it's U, Upsilon, Upsilon. Yeah, Upsilon. Yeah, so up to this, up to this point here, it'd be Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, Zeta, Eta, Theta. Anybody want to take a stab at it? Just like trying to go through that number. Anybody? Anybody brave enough? The higher hard, the you would actually, uh, up to N. You, you think you can do it? Uh, yeah. The good kid passed. The good kid. <laughs> uh, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, uh, epsilon, zeta, eta, theta, iota, capital lambda, mu, nu. Oh, the, yeah, I don't know. When you say iota... It, yeah, it kind of seems like it'd be like, hey, I don't give an, uh, an iota. Like people say that phrase, but but you would actually say iota, iota. Yeah, but that that was really good. That was good. Really good. So yeah, iota. So and, and I think he had a question. Yeah, Frank. Yeah. Frank. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's about the pronunciation. Uh, since it's not a spoken language, I'm wondering why it's pronounced differently from regular Greek. Like it's uh, yeah. you go to the alphabet songs, iota is iota, and then uh, coin Greek, it's iota. Oh, is that how the modern Greeks pronounce it, iota? Yeah, at least in the songs. Oh, yes. okay, okay. Yeah, because I know there's definitely some differences. Um, you know, I, I went through a video that a, a guy did here recently that seemed to be pretty well versed on a lot of languages. And, you know, in fact, I could share that video of him. I want to watch to see it. But he was like making the argument going all the way back to this period. So this this language here, I'll just give you um, after we finish the alphabet here, I'll give you guys a little history. Um, so this is Koine. Um, the language that was that this was spun off of that didn't change hardly at all. Very little was called Attic. And so Attic was kind of like the language that, you know, I, you know, some of these writings, Aristotle, you know, Homer's Iliad, whatever that they were written in. Um, and then the New Testament, and then uh, the actually the Old Testament was translated um, into uh, into Greek and it was Koine. So uh, from sources I've heard, David Brousseau was one, was is that it was like one of the first um, writings in, you know, I would love to verify that with people like Dr. Christopher Rico or something at Polish Institute, but that was something that Brousseau had found that that was like one of the first, you know, writings of that caliber that used Koine instead of, you know, some people would call it, he would call it the literary Greek, um, but it's actually called Attic Greek. Um, but yeah, since then, this guy in this video was making an argument how um, that you know, that going all the way back to the time of Attic, that Greek has hardly changed. And when you compare it to other languages, um, it's like the language that has changed the least. It hasn't changed that much. And it's never had any dead times. It's always been a living language. 
which some languages can't really say that, you know, um, there's definitely been some times from what I've heard to where Hebrew at the most was practiced by some of the, you know, the leaders in the Jewish communities, um, but not really a widespread, there was, there's periods through the last 2000 years where that has been the case. So, and I think there's some other languages like that too. So, um, but yeah, so to answer your question, um, this pronunciation is using the Erasmian pronunciation, which I know kind of really irks a lot of modern Greek people. A lot of times I've seen them making, you know, comments on some of the, uh, you know, video YouTube, uh, videos that I've checked out comments on and seeing modern Greek people just really, you know, attacking the pronunciation and saying, you guys don't know what you're talking about, blah, 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 you know, and it's, and there is some differences. So um, there's there's some things I've seen and in, in, uh, like we'll see when we start using some real basic pronouns like the word for we versus you all. Uh, that's one of the weaknesses of modern English is you can't distinguish between you plural and you singular. But you can in the times of the King James because they would have um, thou and uh, and uh, thee and let's see what's the other one or whatever. But where they would have a distinction, just like in the South, they have a distinction, y'all versus you. Um, but, um, but yeah, you'd say uh, humes is is what you would say for plural, y'all, versus hemes is what you'd say for we, right? So when modern Greeks pronounce that, it sounds exactly the same. And I just find that very hard to believe that going way back, you know, to that, that period that, you know, you got an upsilon, which we'll get into what a rough breathing mark is on the front end of humes. And then you've got eta with the rough breathing mark, which would be this letter on the front of it. Otherwise, the rest of it's the same maze, you know, hey, maze. Um, and it, you would pronounce them the same. So but that's what they do today. And there's some little things like that, you know, scattered throughout the language, other than the fact some of the vocabulary is is kind of. Uh, just had the snowball effect through time, just like th with English. There's a lot of vocabulary we have today that they didn't have 100 years ago or 200 years ago or so. Um, so, so anyway, so is considered, yeah. Is this considered one of the? You hear that phrase? I don't know. It's all Greek to me. <laughs> right. It's like one of the one of the more difficult languages to learn. That's what I've heard. On... Yeah, it is definitely challenging. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know enough no. languages to know that for sure, but from the few that I do know, it's definitely the hardest of the languages I know. So, um, but anyway, yeah, you'll you'll bump into different pronunciations out there. It's not just like this pronunciation, this Erasmian versus uh, the modern. Um, there's even some different spins on what people would call a restored. Uh, I've heard different things. Restored. There's a like some. Scholar Randall Booth, Greek scholar, uh, came up with a restored pronunciation or whatever, and it's similar to Erasmian, but it's not exactly the same. There's some definite differences, so you'll bump into that sometimes. Like I can, you know, over time, you guys will be pointing you to a lot of the same sort of internet or YouTube videos or materials that kind of help me that you guys can check out. And there's one particular guy, uh, Paul, uh, what's his last name, who's a, a Lutheran. Um, He's a Lutheran guy. I don't want to say, I don't know if he's a pastor, but he's definitely a teacher. And he's taught a lot of classes in, um, in Africa, I think in, I want to say Nigeria, but I'm not sure if that's, that's right. Um, I forget exactly where, but um, in any case, uh, when you listen to his pronunciation, it's more akin to modern Greek, I think. So I've had some exposure to modern Greek, but not enough to know it that well to know that for sure but so in fact i went through the guy that i was referring to four minutes ago he did another video where he said in one video i will show you all the differences between ancient greek and modern greek and he was making the argument which i mean i even made comments on the video and i said hey man i mean good point good argument whatever he was making a presentation of why he advises anyone that's going to learn greek to learn modern pronunciation because he says, if you do that, well, then you can go practice with those modern people and they'll kind of follow along with a lot of stuff you're saying, because a lot of them go to Orthodox Greek, Orthodox church or whatever. So they'll kind of know some of this old stuff. 
and uh, you'll get a lot of practice. And so, I mean, that was a reasonable argument and stuff. So, um, so, but anyway, so this is, this is what I learned. There's a big community out there, of both Protestants and Catholics that use the Erasmian pronunciation. So, you know, there's all kinds of different arguments and stuff. So, but I think in some cases, a, a lot of what we're already learning how to pronounce this, that even with the variations, a lot of times there'd be a lot of similarity between a lot of it. Um, there might be some, some differences though, but there would definitely be some differences, but, and some of that would be mostly probably in, and I think this would be an accurate statement, probably more so in some of the vowels and then consonants and stuff. So, but, um, so anyway, so finishing up here. So, Upsilon, Upsilon, sorry, Upsilon. Everybody say Upsilon. Upsilon. Okay. Upsilon. And then fee. You just got to pay your fee. <laughs> right? Yeah. Fee. Okay. We got a free fee. We got a free fee. Uh, so, um, and then, you know, this, this is a tough one. So, yeah, this is, I mean, to me, this is tough. Uh, this one was kind of tough. Uh, it's day, it's data. Uh, a little challenging. Those are probably for me. Those are the toughest. Um, so this one is you got to get the, almost like that guttural sound, like the Hebrews and the Arab, you know, the Arabs and stuff, you know. But instead of it just being key, it's kind of a he, he, he. And sometimes when it's on the front end of a word. You, you'll pronounce that. And sometimes when it's in the middle of a word, it almost just sounds like a K. So, um, but yeah, try, try that. Ki, ki. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. That's probably better than me. That's good. Okay. Ki. Yeah. So this would be the letter that'd be on the front end, the word they translate as grace or thanks. Uh, let's see. Do I have my Greek keyboard on? Yeah, I do. Okay. So... Notice I use the ending sigma at the end there. So charis. So charis. So there's two syllables there. Charis. So yeah, so this is the chi. So charis. Some people would just kind of make it like sound like a ch. And they'll just say, you know, like, oh, sorry. Get my English keyboard. And you'll see this in lexicons when they kind of phonetically spell it. And they'll just say, and people just say charis or charis or I'll just say that, you know, kind of like a gringo going across, going south of the border, trying to speak Spanish or something, <laughs> Karis or Karis or, or whatever. Um, and so this here, uh, C. C, yeah, you got to get a, get that P sound on the front end. So C, and, and it's as challenging as uh, this one up here with the Kappa Sigma. So you got to say C, and this one's here, C. So those are some of the challenging so, ones. So is it is there any like right now when we're pronouncing these, we have to use you know each letter to make the sound. But are there any words in Greek that have like this kind of letter in, in modern languages? I'm I'm sorry, but I kind of heard you, but then you started fading a little bit. Maybe if you get closer to the mic or something. But yeah. There you go. Are there any silences in the Greek language when there's words that are made? Or is it pretty much anything, any letter used in the Greek language that has a sound with it? Is okay. It like, like the word, like the word in English, not. K-N-O-T. Oh, is so, there any you don't hear letters that are silent when you pronounce them? Okay, okay. Um, I'm just asking. Trying to think if I've seen that. I don't think so. I don't think I've ever That's noticed that. Yeah, I don't think I've ever Serious? never noticed that. Yeah, I probably would remember that if 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 I'd seen that. But yeah, so so anyway, so C, you just gotta make sure you get that P on the front end of that. Um, yeah, so these two basically, almost like the P S there, C, and then uh, and then here the long, like Omicron, like O. So this is like a longer O, Omega. So. Say Omega. Omega. There we go. Cool. All right. Anybody else want to 
try and go through the whole alphabet? Anybody brave enough there? Mm, no, I'm fairly uh, able to keep up there. You want to give it a try? Can, Frank, you want to do it? I can't see all the letters to pronounce. Like the whole... Go ahead. Well, yeah, I can try. Um, I can only get up midway. But you know what would really be helpful is if we had those uh, flashcards like on your phone. Okay. So, like, Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and do the alphabet. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, epsilon, uh, zeta, beta, eta, iota, kappa, lambda, mu, nu, and where am I now? <laughs> C. Yeah, right up here. Yeah, right up at the top there. C. It's this oh, one. is that where we are? Well, or if you just want to look down here, but you can see the pronunciation, C, yeah. yeah. C, Omicron, I can see the pronunciation up there now, so. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, so yeah, where, where'd you leave off, P? Omicron, P? Oh, yeah, okay. Omicron, P, Rho, Sigma, Tau, uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, yeah, this one right here, Upsilon. Epsilon, uh, phi, T, C, and Omega. Yeah, perfect, perfect. That's good. That's good. Yeah, you just, it's going to take a lot of practice. I really encourage you guys to practice throughout the week. Yeah, as far as flashcards goes, um, let's see. What could we do for that? Um, you could always, yeah, try and write. I really encourage you guys to write these out. Get you a notebook. I did that a lot. Or just start just writing a lot of alpha, 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 beta, 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 <laughs> gamma, 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 gamma. Just writing them out, writing them out. I really encourage you to do that. Um, but, yeah, Lewis, you want to give it a shot? Just, you know, you can always just start. I can't the see the whole list of pronounces. I'm on a phone. Okay. Is that better? Okay. I, I, there we go. I'll zoom. All let right. me zoom it up alpha. a little bit. Let me zoom it up a little bit. Can you see that better? Yeah, I can see it. Well, it just disappeared. Whatever it was a second ago was better. Now I can't see any, anything. You it's can't like see? Little... Let's see. There it is. Okay, here we go. Is that good? I can see I can see up to um, Lambda. Okay, yeah, I'll just so. keep scrolling it. Okay, so Alpha... Beta and it disappeared. Oh yeah. I'm not that good yet. Yeah, it disappeared. Okay, there we go. You Alpha. Get it? Oh, it's gone. Oh, there it goes. Hmm. Okay. Let's see if it stays. Alpha, beta, and gone. Hmm. Okay, is there something on my end or? I don't know, man. It's hey, Jim, can you see it okay? My, Frank, uh, can you see it okay? Is it disappearing on you guys? No, I can see it. Oh, but then he's yeah, on a phone, I, though, too. Um, yeah, I'm using a phone. I'm using a PC, so. Okay. Uh, I mean, I can't see the whole thing. Like, mine keeps disappearing and coming back. Is, it, is that okay? How's that? I mean, I can see it. Okay, right there. It's the whole screen right now. Okay. That's perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah, Alpha. Let me zoom yeah. it up a little bit. I'll zoom it okay. to that font there. How's that? I got a little bit of delay, so if you're still doing it, let's see what happens. Okay. All right. Oh, that's good. Man, especially for an old man. Yeah. There you go. All right, here we go. Alpha, beta, they keep disappearing. I don't want to uh, belabor this situation. Hey, uh, you know what? Maybe it might be the internet. Why don't you kill your um, your video? And because that maybe that's using up all your bandwidth on the internet, and then maybe you'll get a better signal. Won't cut in and out. Try that. You see the button right on um, Google Hangouts for a video? Just click that. Like like oh. Let's see. 
Oh, I don't even have access on mine. But anyway, but can you see right near the red hang up button to the right? There should be like a button where you can click on the video, turn the video off. Try that. Yeah, my phone's wigging out on me right now. All right, let's mm. see. I'm going to hang up the, uh, hang up the microphone. Or, yeah, the video. Yeah, so, okay. Is it still fl flaking out? Yeah, I'm going to try it real quick. If not, I'll just maybe just do it on my own. But I'll say that again. Yeah, I did it again. Forget it. <laughs> okay, man. Let's do it again. Oh, well. Okay. All right. Here, it just popped up again. Now you're scrolling. So I, try, I think I turned off my camera. Okay. Okay. Um, alpha, beta. Oh, man. Every time I go to read it, it hears my voice and it won't let me do it. Oh, wow. That's strange. Oh, well. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Yeah. So, yeah, just practice it when you can. That's cool. All right. So, yeah, now, do you guys know the history real quick of, uh, you know, the Septuagint and Alexander the Great and all that? I can go into that for like three or four minutes or something. Um, how we, how the I, New Testament ended up being in the Koine Greek language, basically. I think I heard you mention it briefly somewhere else, but I don't know. I don't know it. Oh, okay. So, yeah, it's basically, um, let me make this small. So, yeah, you know, as we see in the Bible, you know, we see Daniel prophesy that, you know, there's Babylon, you know, especially like chapter two, you know, we got Babylon with the statue and then we got the Persians are going to come and be the reigning power. And then after that, the Greeks are going to come. And that's that's what history records. That's what happened. Right. So, you know, Alexander the Great's father, you know, they were Macedonians. And I think the Macedonians ended up conquering the Greeks or, or somehow. But anyway, they ended up coming together. Almost probably similar to the story between the uh, Mideast east Persian Empire being kind of a combined um, sort of thing. Almost like in the corporate world, you got acquisitions and then you got mergers. <laughs> you got like acquisitions where the big fish swallows the little fish, you know, and then you got mergers where almost like it's like a partnership or something. So, but anyway, in any case, uh, we got the Macedonian and Greek Empire. So, uh, you know, Alexander the Great's father was a general, and he ended up dying, and then Alexander took over, and uh, he ended up conquering much of the world over there, um, you know, just did so much more than what his father had done. The other thing was, he was a student, I think, of Aristotle, I believe it was, and so, um, you know, he had kind of a, a view of just the love for Greek, uh, everything about Greece. The architecture, the language, the philosophy, you know, the the wisdom or whatever. And so he wanted to pass it on. So when he was conquering the peoples, he did it in a kind of little bit of a, uh, um, I don't know how we would characterize it, but it's definitely, if, if you surrendered, then, you know, he treated you very well. I mean, your, your nation, your, your people you assimilated the things that were good kind of you know chew the meat spit out the bone kind of approach to every culture assimilated that into the sort of culture but at the same time passed on greek culture and um you know all the things about the greeks you know their gods their their philosophy their language their all those sorts of things so so basically the attic language attic greek language started spreading throughout that whole region and then, you know, within a relatively short period of time, it started kind of morphing a little bit from the influence of other languages, not a whole lot, but a little bit to where it kind of resembled more like Koine Greek. And when we look at the, from the little bit that I have done um, of looking at, as I'm reading through the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, um, you know, it's not that much different than the New Testament, which is written, you know, 300 years later, you know, so... But basically, uh, uh, so much of that, that land over there, uh, parts of Asia, you know, stretching out to like India and, and, and that sort of thing. I don't know, parts of China or something, I don't know. But definitely like 
lots of that area over there. I forget exactly where the boundaries were, sweeping up into modern day Turkey, maybe even what we would call modern day Russia, you know, Europe, um, you know, Rome, Italy, um, North Africa, um, Palestine, uh, Egypt. I mean, that whole landmass, it, it just all got conquered and became part of this, this, you know, Greek empire. And so, um, so when Alexander the Great died, somewhere around the early 30s, um, he ended up, um, he, his generals came, he had four generals, and they all came in and basically took over the, you know, the kingdom, and they kind of split it between them. And so this one general, put, you know, Ptolemy, but the, here's an example. Um, the P is actually silent. So to uh, Lewis's uh, question there. So it's, it's spelled in our alphabet, P T. O L E M Y are now in our alphabet, um, but they just pronounce it in English anyway. Ptolemy, I, I don't even, I've never even looked at how it's spelled in Greek or, or what would be the pronunciation in Greek. I've always just seen it in English. But anyway, General or yeah, you know, General Ptolemy ended up becoming the emperor or king or whatever, but the ruler of of that region that was within the Alexandrian Egypt area. I'm not sure where the boundaries of all that was. But he got a big segment of that of that land, uh, you know, of that region of those those uh, nations or tribes or whatever, and that you know that whole area, and so somewhere around 280, 270, um, he got it, kind of. Uh, he just wanted to make the world's largest library. I mean, he was, I guess, just feeling really good, kind of almost like we read about Nebuchadnezzar, you know, when he was say, looking at over his kingdom and going, man, and I, I, I awesome, look at my kingdom, you know, whatever. So whatever, he was just looking at all these different conquered peoples. And he was like, you know, there's a lot of wisdom literature scattered among these nations. I want to collect all this literature into a, just a huge, massive library. And so um, this is recorded in a letter by a guy named Aristius, which is dated somewhere in the early 200s B.C., um, and this, this event happened somewhere around 280, 270, 260 BC to where, um, the way it affected, you know, Israel or the Jews was, is that, you know, he ended up, you know, getting some of their scribes that spoke Koine Greek or Attic Greek, Koine Greek, um, and, uh, Hebrew to come and, you know, translate their scriptures into that language to be a part of his library. Now, some people you hear when they tell this story, they won't even, they won't even for some reason, won't even tell this element of it. What they'll actually say, which is just not true, is that the people in that time, referring to the Jews, they wanted the uh, Bible in their own language because they were, you know, assimilated into the Greek culture, at, you know, you know, Greek and, and wherever, whether it's necessarily the Alexandrian Egypt area or anywhere else, but maybe even Palestine, and they wanted it in their language, so they they did this. I don't know why they tell that story, because whether it's the early Christians or whether it's Josephus or Philo, which are both Jews, Philo is early, he's a contemporary or somebody at the same time as Jesus, and then Josephus is, you know, three, four, you know, decades later, um, 70, 60, 80 AD, where he's writing his writings, his history, um, both of them uh, tell about this account, and they even refer to this letter from Aristius, and they speak about it in such a way, not to mention their writings are in Koine Greek. These are Jews writing their writings in Koine Greek, and so they're telling this story. So we got the letter from Aristius. It's dated like somewhere around, you know, 200. I don't think we have a copy that old, so I don't want to say it in that way, but just that according to the claim within the letter, that that's when it was written um, of this guy Aristius. That's, I think, making this, he's, you know, he's, he's telling this to a king or somebody about this event that happened. And so you got these guys, you got early Christians in the second century, third century, telling this, that this is the history of the Septuagint. Not to mention that Justin Martyr even mentions in his writings at 150 that you can go to the island. I'm trying to remember the name of the island that was off the coast of Alexandria, Egypt, where this event took place. And even to this day annually they would celebrate this event that had happened you know that would have been uh 400 ish years before that 
Um, and so there's just such a testimony that this really happened. So basically what happened was, you know, the Jews decided to send from each of the 12 tribes, six scribes from each of the 12 tribes to Ptolemy in Egypt. And so you got 72 translators and some of the writings refer to it as the 72 elders. That's what Justin Martin referred to him as. And what Ptolemy did was, is he wanted to make sure there was no collusion um, between them, you know, you know, by being grouped together, he separated them into independent, almost like little independent condos or apartments or something. I don't know what you would call it. Um, but they were all separated. And like a year later, they all came out and they're like, okay, I'm done. And then Ptolemy took these manuscripts and started comparing them and saw that they all matched. And so they took this as a sign from God to be an approved translation. And so this is the first translation of the Hebrew Bible ever in history. And it was in the Koine Greek language. Now, to me, since the Old Testament testifies that it starts out with the Hebrew people, which are the descendants of Abraham, it's foretelling of a time where the seed of Abraham would bless all nations. Now, that word in Greek, ethnos, is translated in the New Testament by our English translators' discretion. It's what they choose to do to distinguish from the Jews. They, they refer to it as Gentiles. I don't know why. It's probably a word that derives from Latin or something or whatever. But ethnos many times just is just means nations, right? And so sometimes by context, you can go, oh, this is the nations. And he's not referring to the to the Jews. So, so they'll translate it as Gentiles or whatever. But it's just, you know, that's where we get our word ethnic, you know, ethnos. Um, but it just is these nations. So, um, so anyway, I just share that with you. Um, uh, a little bit of history there. And this is how we got the Greek Old Testament, the language base for the Gentiles to receive the uh, the gospel from the apostles uh, throughout the whole world. It was like it was like rolling out the red carpet. It was in place hundreds of years for everybody throughout the world to have a common language. Um, you know, and not saying every single person would know the language, but I think it would be very similar to what we have today with English. I mean, it's it's a very common language throughout the world of English, right? Just like it was for, you know, Koine Greek back then. So for the scriptures to then go out, because there was no New Testament when the apostles went out. They were preaching the gospel from the Old Testament, and they were proven, like we see in the book of Acts, the prophecies in Koine Greek, proven to the world. Wow, this guy was foretold 280 years, you know, when this translation was done before, you know, not to mention years before that for the Hebrew manuscripts. And so they're hearing this story. So people were becoming Christians like crazy and stuff. So, so that's that's the scoop. That's uh, so we have an Old Testament in Koine Greek, which is called the Septuagint, which is actually a Latin word. How you, you know? Is say, that, say it again. How would you spell it in a way I can pronounce it? I'm sorry. Septuagint. Yeah, it's a, right. yeah, it's up to it. That's what they call the um, Old Testament in Koine Greek, and it's a Latin word. Okay. Yeah, Latin word meaning seventy. I guess they round it off instead of making it seventy-two. And so, so here's so here's a little bit too. So the Greeks were in control of that whole landmass up until somewhere around. I think in the first century, I think, is when the Romans um, conquered Greece, I think. But even Daniel's prophecy prophesied, you know, like the toes and that, that part down there towards the bottom of the statue in chapter two of Daniel um, was that the Romans, you know, would come and conquer the Greeks. So it was four peoples. It was the, you know, the Babylonian Empire, then the Persians and then the Greeks and then the Romans. And so the Romans conquer but then it took centuries before the Roman language, which is Latin, to kick in. So Koine Greek remained the language. Um, I mean, when we look at the early church, um, we see almost all the writings, definitely in the second century um, in Greek. The first one to write in Latin was right around 200, which is Tertullian. And he's in North Africa. Um, it'd be like North, Northwest Africa, um, where he was at. Um, so, so yeah. So anyway, let's see. I guess that's that's our hour, isn't it?
So guys, so yeah, so recording this, if you want to go back through it, I'll upload it to YouTube and um, I'll definitely make this link available for this file right here. I'll put the, in addition to the, you know, phonetic spelling in English, I'll put the, like I did the first two letters here in Greek, I'll put that in there before I upload it. And um, so yeah, we can just plan to meet, you know, next Saturday, same time. And if I end up bumping the time a little bit i'll yeah i'll definitely make sure everybody knows so i've got a quick question yes sir when you i guess when you pronounce these uh the pronunciation is obviously going to be different than like if you had an alpha letter there you wouldn't say alpha you would say ah or Right, 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 right. Yeah. So not only, you know, should we memorize how to say the alphabet, we also need to memorize how to pronounce uh, each letter. Right, right, um, right. As they are, as they would be written. Right, right. True, true. Yeah, true. Yeah, good point. I don't know. I didn't think of that. <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you. It's sort of like Spanish. You gotta learn how you say the letter as a letter, and then learn how to use it and how it would sound in a word or any language for that matter. But right, that's a good point. Yeah, good point. Yeah. So you would say, you know, this would basically be pronounced ah, and then you know, bay, and then kind of a g sound, and then d, kind of a d, just like our d, and then you know, very similar to our our e, it'd be like kind of eh, and then it's d. Kind of it's the sound almost like data it's the and then this is um this letter right here is we're gonna look at diphthongs too and we'll get into that next time but uh a diphthong is basically there's seven of them where two uh vowels together oh, let me put my greek keyboard here two vowels together are actually pronounced as if they're one one letter and there's there's seven of those so seven diphthongs we'll get into those next time but this would be pronounced pretty much the same as this so it's going to be like an a sound so it really sounds like this a that's the way this is going to be pronounced and then the diphthong epsilon yoda too which will you don't have to know that now we'll see that but you'll see there's no distinction between that diphthong a and, and then this letter a eta okay and then this is the th just like theta, so you got a th, just like our th, and then e, you know, e, kind of sound, uh, like iota, so it's like kind of like this right here, e. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just yeah for one word just to show you real quick. Um, and it depends. We'll get into the whole thing of accenting. Um, I mean, I guess I could give you a preview real quick, but don't don't feel like you have to memorize this yet. We'll get into it next time. Um, I'm gonna have to go, buddy. Okay, man. Yeah, real but, quick. Uh, yeah. Keep my eyes the next time we're, we'll do this. Yeah, we'll get we'll get more into this next time. We'll just yeah, just stick with what we did so far and any of that you want to practice. So I went over there, but we'll we'll go over that because the accent is gonna affect how it's pronounced and stuff. So, but I'll yeah. work on it too while I'm uh, away from this. For a moment. Yeah. For a moment. Thanks, guys. Okay, guys. Okay, God bless. Right, bye. Okay. God bless. See you. See you next week. See you, guys. See you Frank. Okay. Bye. See you, man. Good to see you. See you, bro. See you, Jim. God bless, bro. God bless, guys. Mm-hmm.